And so welcome everybody back. It's great to see everyone again. Um, this is the second time we've been able to meet like this. And I, just, I certainly left the last time with just a real sense of appreciation that we've got this group. I mean, we all feel it every day. And um, we all know Karen Fundamerva started the, just the idea of a WhatsApp group for doctors to re reach out to one another. And then through all the various things we're all doing, I just think it's such a nice collaborative time that we're all able to come together and um, and just you know share ideas, share support, and more importantly, share knowledge um, at this time. So um, tonight, what, what, you know, just based on what we were able to put together, I thought it was a great opportunity to take Bracha Chiga's um, connections, or so to speak, and she, she helped us uh, make these connections, but so did a couple of people in the community, and I was able to speak to um, Prof. Lucille Bloomberg, and and ask her if she would come on to this um, panel for us. And she said to me that she would, which I'm so grateful for. Just give me one second, I just wanna get my stuff. Okay. So um, tonight we joined by Lucille Bloomberg um, from the NRCD. I'll introduce each of them individually. Prof Adriana Desai from the NRCD and Dr. Kim Peterson from um, also, well, from she works at the moment at, at Nearcare Rosebank Hospital. And this is such an opportunity for and for us to meet them and you know learn from them and ask them some of the things that are on all of our minds. Um, so the way we decided to structure, we would start off by just getting a little bit of um, four of the formalities going at the beginning, and thereafter um, opening up to a Q and A where we could all um, learn some things. Um, so I just wanted to to introduce each of them. Just a few running order things for tonight. Um, I think the way we'll do this is when we get to the chat, we're going to use the chat. So we, we haven't set this up as a webinar because we want people to be able to see one another. We're going to use the chat. When you ask a question in the chat, if you want to ask, I want to be able to give people the opportunity to ask the questions themselves. So if you want to ask it yourself, just write there, I'll speak, and then say your question. And then we'll do our best to spotlight you and let you ask your own question. So I'll just say over to whoever and then Dan will spotlight you and you'll be able to speak. If you are happy for us to ask a question on your behalf, um, Dr. Sky Scott has, from our group has volunteered to, to try and group the questions into, into categories so that we're not repeating the same things again and again and again and we'll try and make the questions the most relevant for the professionals who are helping us um again please use your cameras if you can and yeah thanks thanks very much everyone for coming so just um without further ado i think i should start by just speaking maybe a little bit about uh, i think uh, um lucille are you happy to speak first let's just see if yeah can you going you, first can you, yeah. Okay, fine. I don't, yeah. I know we're talking I'll about go second and then Adrian okay. will go third. Thanks. Okay, fine. Perfect. Okay, so then I'll start off by introducing Kim. So um, I, I met Kim quite a few years ago. Um, Dr. Kim Peaton works at Rosebank uh, Net Care Clinic. She's a specialist physician um, with a subspecialty in infectious disease. She really, you know, everyone's telling us every day that we're on the front lines, but she, she really is on the front lines. Um, she, she's managing, she was just telling us now, like over 50 patients at the moment, just at Rosebank, which is a very small, smaller hospital compared to some of the bigger ones. Um, she managed, she, she, on her own, um, in terms of like, she just come off a, a call for the whole weekend where she's managing these cases and most of them are COVID cases. Um, it's an absolute privilege to be able to learn from someone who, who's dealing with infectious disease uh, to this level and to get the clinical cues that we left off from, from last time as to what is our role as GPs outside the hospital? How do we monitor patients are getting worse um, at an out of hospital level? Who needs admission, who doesn't? Um, you, you know, what, what are the clinical cues and how do we manage this new disease that we or knew this, this new virus that we, none of us have really much clinical experience with? Um, so, Really, thank you, and let me waste too much more time and hand on it to her. Thanks, Daniel, and thanks to everybody for listening and for the opportunity to speak to you all tonight. Can you hear me nicely, Dan? Perfectly. Excellent. So thanks for saying I'm on the front line. I really feel like I take my hats off to all of you GPs because you guys really are 
on the front lines. And I often think to myself how difficult it is to not see a patient and make a clinical assessment and to know what the right thing to do is over the telephone or over an internet chat as to whether it's okay for them to stay at home or if they need to come into a hospital. It's so much easier seeing them in hospital with all the clues and guides that we've got. So I really take my hats off to you. Well done. You guys are doing an amazing job. And um, if there's any way that I can help you at all, please, I'm very happy for Dan to show, share my contact details with anybody. And I'm here to help. And I really feel like that's part of my role in this pandemic, to help other doctors um, get through it. So it's going to be a little bit different tonight because I actually don't have slides to show you. And Dan said that he actually wanted me to chat to you and to have a made it be a bit more interactive. So I'm going to start off with a couple of things which I think is important. Um, hopefully also answering some of the questions which I know you've been forwarding to Dan already. So I hope that I'll be able to answer some of those questions during the course of my chat. And then right at the end, we can probably have a lot more discussion and questions about things which are really burning topics to everyone. So I'm just going to share one slide with you just to remind everybody uh, of the clinical course of COVID, which I'm sure everybody's seen the slide a million times already. But just to start off with, um, the clinical stages of the COVID-19 infection, which due to the massive amount of information in such a short period of time, we realized quite early on in the disease that this was a three-stage disease. The first stage lasting approximately a week after an incubation period of usually between two and seven days with a median onset of about five days, and that's the viral um, viremic phase. So the patients present with the typical kind of symptoms of upper respiratory tract things. In China, in the beginning of the pandemic, very few people had a sore throat. But we know that in South Africa, really a vast majority of people have a sore throat at some stage. And then unfortunately, as we've all seen, almost any other presenting symptom, like a headache, I've had patients with just gastritis or um, abdominal symptoms like diarrhea, even skin manifestations. The viremic phase normally lasts for approximately a week. And it's at the end of of the week, round about day seven, day eight, day nine, that clinical deterioration in less than 20% of patients will occur. At this stage, patients start feeling short of breath um, and may develop this pulmonary phase, which is the um, mnemonic phase. So patients might develop a viral pneumonia. Initially, they just feel a bit short of breath, maybe coughing quite a lot, but are not hypoxic. And then a small proportion of those patients who are in the viral pneumonic stage go on to develop a, hypox a hypoxic pneumonia. And that's typically when you see patients presenting and requiring admission to hospital. So just because they've got a pneumonia does not necessarily need, mean that they need admission. Once you're hypoxic and have pneumonia, a small percentage, less than 5%, will go on to the scary last stage three, which is the hyperinflammatory stage, cytokine storm. Patients have ARDS, massive SIRS responses, cardiac failure, multi-system um, failure, and really a lot of the morbidity and mortality specifically is associated with that hyperinflammatory stage. So... Let's talk about this first stage. So I'll just stop sharing my slide so that you can see me. So we're talking about the first week of infection and what are GPs able to do in that stage? And I think there's two very important things. The first part is obviously and sort of symptom control. And the most important thing for that is that the patients need reassurance that even those with comorbidities and even the elderly are not all going to die and are not all going to need admission. 80% of people are going to get through the illness fine and a lot of people are going to be asymptomatic. So it's to really reassure patients over and over again that we need to be aware but not scared. The second part of the supportive is to manage symptoms and this can be quite difficult with COVID. Um, top of the list is obviously Panado, Paracetamol for fever, um, if they've got a cough, it's trying to work out how to suppress that cough in a safe way. So the things which I like doing are like carvel steams, humidity. So going into the shower and really steaming oneself a lot. 
Um, and besides that, there's really not much else that one can do. There's a lot of controversy around vitamins and support in that way. And some regimens propose using vitamin C, vitamin D and zinc, specifically in the viremic stage to try and control and prevent um, infection developing into the hypoxic pneumonic stage or even the cytokine storm. So um, the, the vitamin C, let's talk a little bit about, about it and what kind of doses would one give if one were to use it. It's very controversial. The, the place where it comes from was um, in vitro, vitamin C does seem to have antiviral pop properties. And in trial, it was used mainly in critical care studies, trying to look at in patients with severe sepsis and septic shock, whether vitamin C made a difference. So there's two big trials, and unfortunately, they contradict each other. The one trial said there was absolutely no difference. The second trial said that there was a very small mortality difference, but the trial actually failed to meet primary endpoints. And so it's a very disappointing study. What they did use, though, was vitamin C in an ICU setting. So apart from that, out of the ICU setting and out of an IV system, we really don't have any evidence that vitamin C works. Just to remind you that the recommended daily allowance of vitamin C for a female is 75 milligrams per day, which is tiny. For a man, it's 90 milligrams per day. You, there is caution for dosing um, vitamin C prolonged periods at high doses in patients who've got renal failure because it may result in an oxalate nephropathy and even aggravate or even cause nephrolithiasis. But we're really talking about months and months and months of massive doses of vitamin C because usually it just gets weed straight out. It's a water soluble vitamin. So uh, is it reasonable to give it in the first viral stage? I don't think it's gonna cause any harm if one gives sort of 500 to a gram of vitamin C a day. Whether it makes any difference, we've got absolutely, unfortunately, no evidence. The second one is the zinc. Again, zinc has been proven to have in vitro antiviral um, activity. And there is, it is actually registered as a common cold lozenge for viral infections. And the lozenge is a 4.5, 23.7 milligrams zinc attached to a gluconate um, molecule. And that can be taken every two hours. So the recommended daily allowance of zinc in a lady is eight milligrams a day and in a man is 11 milligrams per day. So again, you can see that one doesn't need much zinc at all. In a zinc tablet, when we use it for other indications, there's 50 milligrams. So some centers again are giving zinc tablets once or twice a day. One would need to be careful not to give zinc overload. So again, if you're using it for a short burst, I don't think that there's any harm, but unfortunately there's very little evidence that it's gonna make any difference. And lastly, again, vitamin D. Um, about five, 10 years ago, there was massive excitement because vitamin D became a hot topic in infectious diseases. People got really excited thinking that um, infectious diseases were linked to vitamin D insufficiency and that by increasing and boosting the vitamin D levels, one would be able to control a whole host of infectious diseases. And not only that, but that um, vitamin D levels were also low and played a role in diseases like diabetes and hypertension and other sort of metabolic syndrome type things. So some people advocate giving a once-off dose of vitamin D 50,000 units a stat dose. Again, I don't think a once-off dose is going to do any harm, but whether it makes any difference at all is difficult to know. So those are just a couple of points around the vitamins. Now, the other things which have sort of popped up and become um, in and out of favor are things about like chloroquine. So the questions we've had are, should people, especially healthcare workers, be on chloroquine as pre-exposure prophylaxis? There is a big trial and hopefully we'll have the answer to that in healthcare workers on prophylaxis. But just to let you know that, unfortunately, after the Lancet article, with which seems to have been a big hoax and um, really was very poorly done and probably a big fraud, the Solidarity trial has withdrawn the chloroquine, plasmaquine, hydroxychloroquine arm of the solidarity trial and are no longer testing it around the world. There's very little evidence that it does work. The evidence that there is, is very poor in small numbers of patients with lots of confounders. Um, 
so it's kind of probably not worth it, whether for prophylaxis or in um, people for treatment. Would one give it in the viremic stage in the first week? I don't think so. I think that the risk far outweighs the benefits in the first week. Um, we're not able to get ECGs and work out QT intervals. We may not necessarily know all the medications, which could also be prolonging the QT interval and interacting with the chloroquine. And so it does make it dangerous. So I would certainly think twice about using chloroquine either on myself or on a patient in the first week of illness. Um, uh, lastly, or second lastly, steroids in the first week of illness are not indicated. So we're all really excited because finally, finally, three weeks ago, we got the dexamethasone trial, the recovery trial, which showed really very exciting and promising improvements in patients' mortality, like 17% reduction in mortality. But the reduction in mortality and the improvements were seen in only patients who required extra ventilatory support, whether that be a patient who's coming on day seven and who's hypoxic and just needs a little bit of oxygen, or whether it's somebody coming even later and requiring ventilatory support in the form of ventilators or high flow oxygen or something like that. So people in the first phase who do not need any extra oxygen or ventilatory support, there was no difference with steroids. A second reason why we don't advocate steroids in the first week is a concern that you might actually um, worsen the disease in the viremic phase by preventing immune response to the replicating virus in the first seven days. So steroids are really exciting for us in hospital that should be avoided in the first week unless the patient needs it for other things. So if your patient is asthmatic and needs to have a course of steroids because they've got bronchospasm, which may be related to their COVID and precipitated by COVID or may be completely unrelated, obviously that person should have steroids. Similarly, if they're on an inhaled cortisone pump, that pump should not be because the patient has COVID. So carry on whatever the patient needs for the correct indication, but don't start any kind of steroid in the first week of illness. And then uh, lastly, I just wanted to have a word on the anticoagulation, which is another really exciting topic, and I'm sure we'll talk about it a little bit later, is that should we be putting all of our patients on anticoagulation from the beginning, or is this, should this be reserved for in hospital? So what we do in hospital is we're measuring the D-dimer and we know that COVID along with the hyperinflammatory state and the cytokine stimulation stimulates the coagulation cascade at the same time. And this seems to be a really potent stimulation and may result in massive hypercoagulability with the result that patients are developing um, pulmonary emboli, not so much DVT. It seems to be more lung as well as brain neurological CNS effects. And so in an attempt to try and control that, we give patients who have a high D-dimer, and that's the key point, so that we're not just giving it to everybody. It's only those patients who have a D-dimer at least more than one, but probably even higher, um, therapeutic clexane. So that's one milligram per kilogram. Alternatively, an, a NOAC, but you know, it's usually quite difficult to give an oral drug to somebody who's quite sick. Um, and then we give it for as long as what the D-dimer is high for. Some people discharge their patients on it, others stop when the patient gets discharged, provided they didn't have a massive uh, D-dimer and provided um, the discharge D-dimer level has come down really nicely as, and is in the therapeutic range. So friends of mine told me that in the UK, they're giving people uh, Clexane injections or a NOAC right in the first week of infection. Unfortunately, we just don't know enough. So it may be right. And it might be what we're going to be doing in two weeks time, because as you know yourselves, these trials just pop up left, right and center. And perhaps that's something that we're going to do, but we just don't know. And at the moment, a bit of a thumbs up. 
By and large, though, the vast majority of people in the first week of infection are not going to have raised D-dimers and so probably do not need anticoagulation. So I would steer clear of it and not advise it, especially not in the ones that are likely to become the sickest, like the elderly and those with comorbidities, because the risks just outweigh the benefits. So which patients would you consider admitting at the end of these seven days? So remember, when did you get symptoms? We're not really too worried about the asymptomatic people. So if you tested and you tested positive, the next question to ask is, um, what kind of symptoms do you have and when did they start so that you can work out when your day seven, day eight is, so you know when the patient's gonna start deteriorating. The next step in my mind is to work out who is a low risk and who is a high risk person. The low risk people, when sort of calms down a bit, but the high-risk people, one really wants to um, monitor them quite closely. And obviously it's the elderly, anyone with a comorbidity and any overweight, obese person. Um, and then try and work out where they are in the stage of disease. And for that one may need bloods. So in the vast majority of COVID patients in the first week, you usually don't need bloods. But I do advise doing bloods in a high risk person who you think is going to go pear shaped um, or in somebody who's starting to deteriorate. What are you looking for? We're looking for the white cell count, which is usually normal or low. And that's specifically the lymphocyte count, which starts dropping. So if they have a very high white cell count and it's neutrophils, one needs to also say, oh, is this really COVID or is it something else? Similarly, in the first week of illness, the CRP is normal or low, often really in the normal range. And as they progress, the CRP starts climbing, but it's usually not dramatic. CRP is usually by day seven, day eight of 30 or 40, usually not much higher. So how can we monitor these patients at home, given that it's really difficult to see them in, their, in our rooms? So first of all, it's to actually talk to the person and see how long can they talk to me before they need to stop and take a breath? Can they finish a whole sentence or um, can they walk and talk at the same time? Or are they lying in bed and pushing out one or two words? That's obviously scary. The second thing is, we need to know, are you having persistent recurrent temperatures, even though you're already day eight or day nine? So has your patient got a thermometer at home and can they do temperature monitoring? And then lastly, can the patient buy a pulse oximeter? You can order it on take a lot for about 300 Rand delivered to your door within two days. Some GP practices have bought a whole lot and are sort of renting it out to their patients. Get your money back for 100 bucks a week after seeing three patients. And I think it's really a great way. So the kind of signs one wants to look out for are SATs less than 92% a heart rate that is more than 120, a respiratory rate of more than 25, and a persistent fever of more than 39, or the opposite if they're really cold and it's less than 36. So those are the kind of things which one would think about of admitting the person, but to be extra vigilant, as I said, in those high-risk patients, the elderly, the obese, and those with comorbidities, to really have a low index of suspicion around day seven, day eight, that if they're really not feeling better, probably need to be reassessed or even admitted straight to the hospital. So I think I should probably stop there. I've got lots more to say, but I don't want to cut into other people's time and we'll talk a bit more afterwards. Thanks everybody. Thank you, Kim. You spoke to most of the issues that we're going to, I'm sure, deal with. So it was really great. And I think that the other issues that you have are probably going to come up in the Q&A. Um, I certainly would like to discuss at some point these patients who perhaps the vitals are not showing much difference so or much aberration, I should say. So patients who, we, we've seen a few of these in our practice where the, the vitals are pretty good um, in terms of home monitoring, but then the bloods show quite a lot of derangement and those aren't, have, they have, haven't always been high risk patients. So we have a bit confounded as to what to do, but I think let's come to that in the Q and A um, and perhaps move to Prof, did you say Prof Bloomberg, you wanna speak next? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm next. Okay, great. So, I'm, so, so, I'm, great. So, so. I'm getting a visit from the cat, sorry. <laughs> no, no problem. It's better than a visit, a visit from the child, I promise you. <laughs> um, so let, let, me, let me introduce Prof Bloomberg to, um, for, for those of us who don't know her. Um, so Prof Bloomberg is, um, we, we're again, very honored to have her with us. She's from the NRCD, I suppose, technically. 
but she holds a lot of, 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 of titles and backgrounds to her. She's at the moment the deputy director for the NICD, but she was the founding head of the Division of Public Health and Surveillance and Response. She was, uh, she's a WITS graduate, for well, those of us who want to be proud. Um, she's a prof, she's an associate prof in uh, the Department of Microbiology as well uh, at, at the University of Stellenbosch, if I'm correct. Um, she's been a, she's a member of on quite a few expert committees of the WHO. Um, she was the 2001 president of infectious disease, uh, president of infectious disease society. Um, she doesn't want all these things, but the bottom line is, as you can hear from the stuff, she's got a lot of um, experience, both formal and informal, in the detection, control, and surveillance of infectious disease. So. Um, with her work at the NRCD, I'm really grateful to have her able to speak to us in this kind of level. And so let's just get to her and say thank you very much. Uh, um, good evening, everyone, and thanks very much, Dan, for the invitation. Um, and can I have the first slide? I think you've got them. Yeah, D Dan Stillerman will share them for us. Yeah, yeah thanks, other Dan. I think we have a visitor behind you. <laughs> So thanks very much, Bracha, and thanks very much, Dan, for the invitation. And, and really, all of you take great care out there at the front line. Um, I'm going to look at the laboratory diagnosis, and things have really <laughs> changed over the last few weeks. And then I'm going to move on to the um, quarantine and isolation criteria, and those are currently changing. So there's the virus, a, a really um, beautiful virus. and. Uh, come back in your next life as a computational biologist. Can I have the next slide, please? So at the beginning of the, um, of the pandemic here, uh, we were all doing PCRs, but this is currently the, the status of, of PCR and the laboratories are totally overwhelmed. Next one, please. So next slide. So who should be tested? Um, we've had to prioritize, and both in the public sector and, the, um, and in the private sector, they've now moved to, to prioritizing uh, patients where the, where the result will change management and will really uh, prompt the, the appropriate um, infection prevention control measures and treatment. But most importantly, patients with pneumonia, especially those who are hospitalized, um, as well as those in the community, particularly those who have risk factors for severe uh, COVID. The second group are those um, who are healthcare workers, and um, it's not, not just doctors and nurses, but it's, it's the broad spectrum of healthcare workers uh, who present with a clinical syndrome that's suggestive of COVID, uh, because one obviously has to manage them in the workplace. Um, I think persons with acute respiratory illness, if it's at all possible, um, and I think you're all familiar with the, the, the signs and symptoms that, um, that have been mentioned. Uh, I think it is important to try and get a diagnosis with those who have an illness suggestive of COVID, uh, with those with comorbidities, older people, those with obesity, because you want to monitor them carefully. And when they uh, deteriorate, at least you know what you're dealing with and you can rapidly admit them to hospital initially for uh, the important oxygen therapy. I think patients uh, with sorry, chronic risk. Uh, yeah. Yes. Sorry, sorry Prof. Um, th there's quite a lot of audio interference. I think the mic okay, might let me be take... a little bit. Yeah. Is that better? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead like that, and we'll let you know. But okay. I think that probably is better. Yeah. Cool. I th yeah. I could also hear it. Could you hear what I was saying before? Anyway, you can read it. Um, yeah. That if, if there's enough capacity, I think those with chronic respiratory illness with new onset of the above symptoms. Hospitals are requiring people who are admitted for other reasons, for particular types of surgery, eye surgery, gastrointestinal um, scopes, um, ENT surgery, because those would be high risk for the surgeons, um, even those who are asymptomatic, because we have a lot of people who are asymptomatic now, uh, pre-surgery, and those who require admission or um, outpatient th therapy for things like dialysis or chemotherapy. Uh, we're still doing uh, repatriation samples, but travelers are really a thing of the past. What we're not doing is symptomatic contacts of positive cases um, or just contacts of positive cases. 
because really uh, no capacity. Next one. So the, um, the, the uh, test of choice, and it's an imperfect test, remains a PCR. PCR detects the uh, viral RNA. Um, I think you all know about collection of specimens. Many uh, laboratories have run out of swabs. And really, you can do a nasal swab or a turbinate swab or an oropharyngeal swab or an, um, an oral swab, um, a throat swab. And um, saliva has not quite been properly evaluated. So most laboratories will not, uh, not accept it. And obviously, that would be very much easier. The patient has pneumonia, um, and I think this would apply really to hospitalized patients. Um, low respiratory tract infection samples uh, would really be important. But I think most of the sampling now is done um, by a laboratory site. It's not done in GP rooms. And obviously, it's a risk procedure uh, that, um, that, that, that uh, requires the person doing it to be uh, protected. Next one. Next slide. Dan, next slide. Okay. Um, that should be on the so, next one. So it's still um, the PCR. It's about 70 to 80% sensitive. Uh, it is specific for SARS-CoV-2. Um, I think laboratory contamination is not really a, a major issue at the moment. We have a number of uh, scenarios where people say, well, you know, I had one test, it was positive, then I did it in another laboratory and it was negative. Obviously, the quality of the sample is really important. How it's transported to the lab may change things. And if you get one positive sample, you need to regard it as positive. And then, you know, if there's successive days where you do samples because you didn't believe the first one, you need to take whatever is positive. The, uh, the testing uh, turnaround times are, are very variable at the moment. I know the labs are really working hard to bring them down and hence the need to prioritize specimens. You know, in some cases, people were waiting 10, 12, 14 days, and really that didn't um, help any uh, uh, public health intervention and certainly didn't help patients and management in hospitals. So I think with the prioritization of specimens, many labs now have brought their turnaround times down to less than 48 hours. The ideal test would be the gene expert or similar. These are rapid, you get results in an hour, near patient tests. Um, they're still laboratory tests, but there's very limited availability of the cartridges, which I think you know them from, from TB testing. If you really highly suspect the case as being um, uh, one of, of COVID and you have an initial negative test, I think you should repeat it. Obviously, the quality of the specimen, uh, as we've mentioned. Please don't forget um, tests for differential diagnosis. Um, if you're working in a malaria area, um, and I think most of you are in Johannesburg, you know, consider malaria and other respiratory infections, which at this time of the year are quite important. Interestingly, we have very little influenza. I'm sure the lockdown, children not being at school, the uh, distancing, the use of masks and hand hygiene um, has really reduced the number of uh, influenza um, infections. Uh, season's not over yet, uh, normally uh, last till about September. I think we'll have to wait and see. But uh, almost no influenza from our surveillance program. Next slide. So what about rapid tests? So there are two types. The one is a rapid test, which is a point of care test. It's a sort of dipstick. You put a bit of blood on. They measure IgG, IgM, and some of them do IgA. Um, they really have been quite disappointing. One has been recently um, approved by SAPRA. It's the Orient gene. The problem with the rapid tests are they remain um, of low sensitivity. Um, and they're not positive, can't be used in the acute part of infection to make choices about treatment. And really, one can only uh, um, rely on the sensitivity after, the, after about 10 to 14 days after the onset of illness. So they cannot and should not be used to manage, a uh, diagnose and manage um, patients in the first 14 days. They can't be used for immune passports. Uh, we really don't know anything about uh, immunity, and whether a negative or a positive uh, says that you are you know, safe to return to work or to travel. 
Um, I think they will only be used for seroprevalence surveys looking back at the outbreaks in communities, and some of the tests will be used for um, the vaccine trials that are currently ongoing. But there are also lab-based serological tests. I don't think any of them have been uh, approved yet. And the rapid test that has been approved is only going to be used um, for special circumstances. So it's, it, it's not out there. It's not available for your use. And I know it's very tempting because PCR is expensive. Turnaround times uh, are long sometimes. And um, the specimen is not always a pleasant or easy one to take. But please do not use them for diagnosis of patients with immune disease, with uh, in acute uh, a disease. Next one. What about um, quarantine and what about isolation? Um, so these guidelines are in uh, the process of being changed. You always heard about the magical 14 days. Well, I think. Um, it was a very conservative uh, time for, um, for isolating, quarantining, um, and I think much more recent information uh, using cultures, uh, epidemiological data, would suggest that much shorter times uh, can be used. So one looks at particularly at healthcare workers. I think hospitals are really struggling. They have quite a large number of healthcare workers who are infected, many of them are actually asymptomatic, and just picked up on uh, routine testing, which I think many hospitals are conducting. Um, this is the proposed um, plan for healthcare workers. So for mild cases, um, a confirmed positive or an asymptomatic person who is confirmed positive on routine testing, you can de-isolate, bring them back to work eight days after the symptom onset should really allow for at least three days of temperature settling and patients and the, the healthcare workers starting to um, be symptom free or less symptoms uh, to bring them back. Severe disease is a slightly different scenario, probably um, longer um, viral shedding. So it's eight days after clinical stability. So temperature's down, oxygen's no longer needed. Um, uh, eight days, and again, it would really depend on their, um, their ability to work. I think one has to do a proper assessment. There is no indication for repeat PCR testing. And a positive PCR eight days after onset of illness really does not differentiate viable virus versus the presence of RNA. So repeat testing is not indicated. What about high risk exposures? Um, well, this is, uh, I think, created a, it's quite a controversial issue now, but um, a high-risk exposure would be somebody who is in contact with a, a positive patient um, within a meter and not properly protected by PPE. And properly protected really means a proper face mask and uh, some, something to protect your eyes. So we suggest a PCR at five days if it's negative, um, and it'd probably take a day or two or three to get the results back. Uh, you can de-isolate, bring them back to work, but they should wear proper PPE, a surgical mask, a visor. You need to monitor symptoms. Uh, they should avoid contact with the severely immunocompromised patients, adhere to the usual hygiene measures, and uh, self-monitor uh, for any temperature. If they develop a temperature, they need to be retested and then if they're positive, obviously they would go back to the, uh, the eight days. Uh, last slide. Last slide, Dan. Okay, de-isolation of COVID positive patients. Uh, this is much easier. Uh, mild cases, eight days after symptom onset, um, they can be de-isolated. They can go back to work if they're clinically well and uh, good assessment, you, you're comfortable with them going back to work. And severe disease, uh, eight days after clinical, clinical stability achieved. So I saw a question about clinical stability. It's really somebody's off, off oxygen, the temperature's settling, uh, they're not requiring any support, um, uh, eight days, but again, a good you know, clinical assessment of the ability to go back to work. Again, no indication for repeat PCR testing. I think that's something that's uh, still being done, and it's obviously a 
not good use of, of limited tests. So I think I'm going to stop there and uh, hand over to, to Adrian. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Lucille. We really appreciate that. Um, there's going to be a lot of questions on this quarantining, I think, in the days. So I'm not going to waste our time because I want us to move ahead, but thank you for that. So let me quickly just say, so Pro Prof Adrian Desai is, some of us know him very well. He certainly lectured to me at medical school and still continues to. Um, he's the head of the Departments of Microbiology um, at WITS. Uh, he's the academic chair of pathology at WITS. Um, he's written papers on infection control. I've asked him tonight to focus a lot on PPE and our safety. I think that for for doctors, for us, this is a really scary time. We've seen people in our own group who at the moment are clinically po are positive, and we see that every day we're exposed to risk. There's a lot of questions to be asked as to, um, you know, how much precaution should we be taking? Are we, should we be, you know, we see how people, we see in the media, we see even our colleagues in ICUs and the, 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 the hazmat suits and should GPs be wearing hazmat suits? And if they are wearing hazmat suits or they aren't wearing hazmat suits, are they putting themselves at risk? Is it about viral load versus the different types of exposure? So it's, it's wonderful to have him with us and um, let's hand over to him. Right, good evening, everybody. Um, great to be part of this meeting. So thank you very much for the invitation. Right, so I've got slides, um, 20, but they will all be spoken to for a few seconds. So don't panic, we'll get to the question and answer session quite soon. In the first instance, I just want you to be aware that as we've gone past 12,900,000 cases of COVID and a fair amount of more than 250,000 in South Africa, what is quite interesting in my workplace and certainly also in the suburb where I live, is that despite the fact that we are going to uh, see more and more cases of COVID and we're at highest risk now, people with the lifting of the lockdown level to level three have taken more liberties than they should. And in fact, there is a direct correlation between uh, the lockdown level and the morbidity and mortality that has been seen. And this is illustrating this graph really to actually make an impact on people that lifting a lockdown level does not mean that all is safe and all is good. And that social responsibility and certainly in the workplace, it's critically important for people to maintain a safe environment at all times. So I'm not sure how many of you already have uh, addressed um, social distancing in your practices by doing telephonic consults or SMSs or, or any other such like practice or how many of you have actually thought of doing home visits? One of the advantages of home visits is that to disinfect a practice is quite tedious and quite complicated um, and also takes a fair amount of time. So you might want to actually relook at the way in which you do things so that you go where uh, the infection is rather than bring in fact the patient uh, to you. And an assessment can be done through telephonic consultation uh, before you decide to do a home visit. Please remember that if you do home visits, you've got to request the patient has open windows before you get there in the room for good ventilation. Remember to bring your own sanitizer and basic personal protective equipment. It's always better to try and avoid face-to-face uh, -face consultations um, because really the hassles that and the anxiety that uh, exposures, potential exposures cause are really um, quite, quite alarming. Please remember that although we're not seeing many cases of vaccine at the, uh, of, of influenza at the moment, it really is a very good idea for you to persuade uh, your patients and yourselves, by the way, to take uh, influenza vaccine. We know that uh, the efficacy of these vaccines can vary from 40 to 70%. Um, that is not the point. If you can reduce the anxiety and the presentation with a respiratory infection of even as few as 40% uh, percent of patients, uh, presenting with respiratory illness who have got influenza, so be it. And, and there is, in fact, varying evidence of vaccine efficacy from season to season. Right, if you do insist on looking at patients in your own practice, then please remember that any vulnerable staff that you have, receptionists, etc., older than 60 or with underlying morbidities, must actually be protected in some way and assigned to work in a different workspace uh, or uh, in an area where there's no exposure. Um, if you really have to do face-to-face uh, -face appointments, try and avoid walk-in appointments, again, through telephonic 
questionnaires, triaging, asking for patient risk factors, organize your day into cohorts so that you actually do clean cases, the non-infectious, non-respiratory first, and you do the rest um, at a second session. Space out appointments so there's not trust over of patients, and anybody that comes in with a cough or a sneeze must actually be given a surgical mask and disinfect the hands upon entry. So infection control is really very much of a mop and bucket discipline. But it's very, very important. We always go back to the fundamentals of standard precautions, and that is what you should be practicing in your um, daily lives all the time. This means that every patient is considered to be potentially infectious, and for that, you need to do a risk assessment before you decide what you need to actually wear in terms of PPE. So if a patient is coughing or spluttering, you will want a mask and uh, eye protection. Um, if you're going to examine a patient, again, who's ill, you may want to use gloves. Gloves are not a substitute for hand washing, so hand hygiene as frequently as possible, and certainly before and after every patient visit, um, is critically important. But also the other aspects which I'm sure you're well aware of, of uh, standard precautions, and that talks to how you handle waste, sharps, um, how you clean the environment, etc. Now, there's really three main ways, and this slide is for you to read, not for me to read out to you. Transmission occurs um, basically by coming into contact with respiratory droplets um, uh, at, uh, of patients who are infectious, or actually contacting your cells or your mucous membranes with any contaminated material uh, that is picked up on the hands and brought to the face, for example, or if somebody sneezes or coughs in your face, then direct contact inoculation of your eyes can occur. Aerosols are created when you induce sputum. There is absolutely no uh, indication to induce sputum in this infection. It's a very really dangerous procedure to do. Um, if you do suctioning in a patient care area, um, and certainly, by the way, aerosols are created every time you go to the toilet. So when you flush the toilet bowl, a plume is generated of aerosols of different sizes that actually spat about 1.5 meters around the toilet bowl itself. And these plumes have indeed been linked to super spreading events, for example, in the Amway Gardens case study in Hong Kong, where a defective toilet um, uh, was uh, next to defective plumbing. Uh, these toilet plumes that actually, uh, and also, uh, yeah, the plumbing, the defective plumbing uh, seem to link to an air duct that linked various apartments, not only within one block, but of several blocks of this residential complex, um, and more than 300 cases occurred from, in fact, uh, this particular event. So, so certainly aerosols are important, and they can also occur within the space of your own um, practice and in the toilet. So please always put down the toilet seat when you flush the loo. The WHO has spoken recently of uh, the consideration that the disease may be airborne, and we'll touch on it a little bit later. So contact transmission, please just remember that, in fact, virus can persist on different objects for as long as three to four days. Um, and therefore, although the virus cannot replicate outside of human cells, the viability can remain. And touching any of these surfaces where there is persistent virus and bringing your hands to face, uh, particularly to mouth, mucous membrane, nose, et cetera, uh, would constitute a, pot a potential inoculation event. And this is why actually the recommendation is made to perform hand hygiene as often as possible. So if we consider contact transmission, then please bear in mind that with COVID-19, we have multiple modes of transmission. We have contact transmission, we've got respiratory droplet transmission, we've got mechanical aerosol transmission, and in very, very limited settings, there might well be airborne transmission as well. The kind of kit that you need to have in a practice for contact transmission, I'm going through this because you augment the kits as uh, the exposures um, increase and vary, would be to make sure that you've got a hand washing station, that's a decent sink with uh, anti, well, soap, and hot water and uh, towels, paper towels to uh, dry your hands, have hand sanitizer in abundance, glove, a disposable plastic apron, a surgical mask, uh, goggles and a visor, and if possible, good ventilation. When we have respiratory transmission, which is the other form of transmission other than contact, and very important in COVID-19 disease, 
Um, whenever we cough or we sneeze or we talk, we generate aerosols. And those aerosols pr plumes can be seen from the patient on the top uh, left-hand corner, where you see that there's an expectoration of an aerosol with on the low zone, largely large droplets that actually fall almost immediately to the ground, smaller droplets that may travel up to one to two meters, hence the distance that is always told, social distance, keep 1.2 to one to two meters away from other people. And on the upper area of the plume, you will see in fact a fine mist forming. And in this mist, uh, there will be in fact the so-called smaller droplet nuclei, these are respiratory droplets, that dry out very quickly and can remain suspended in air, particularly in closed environments for various periods of time. Now, it's very easy to really define aerosols into droplets, droplet nuclei, and, um, and uh, <laughs> what you really need to understand is that whenever there's a sneeze and expectoration event, you'll see a continuum of all of these things. So as much as we say that respiratory droplets are a problem, there's no doubt that airborne droplets for short periods of time or for longer periods of time in closed spaces can also be a problem as well. So the classification is somewhat artificial. Remember that this is a, a expectoration of a continuum of different types of droplets. Right, so for droplet transmission, you need exactly the same items that you require for uh, contact precautions, but you need, in fact, a surgical mask. And should a procedure create a mechanical aerosol, some people argue that collecting a nasopharyngeal swab is an aerosol-inducing procedure, and you happen to have an N95 respirator, by all means use it. The reality in our wards, um, and in fact in terms of supplies in the country, is that N95 respirators are not available in abundance. And so um, a, a good fitting surgical mask um, is really the recommendation when you collect an azophanagel uh, swab. By all means, use anything better if you can afford it. A goggle and a or visor is important to protect the eyes. Masks do not cover the eyes. And spatter or uh, direct inoculation of organisms from hands to eyes are a problem. And orders, please, uh, open windows or good ventilation are important. What is really interesting is how people wear masks, including, quite frankly, healthcare workers. I mean, I'm never, uh, I'm never really, uh, <laughs> I never cease to be astounded. Masks are worn at a 45 degree angle to the face. The nose or the two nares are sticking out, or it's worn around the neck or dangling from one ear. Um, if you don't wear PPE properly, <laughs> you will not get any protection. And please don't waste the PPE because there are many people in the healthcare sector that are desperately looking for a decent mask uh, and would actually value using it properly. Please remember also to replace masks with a new clean dry mask. The minute you see that your mask is damaged or damp, do not reuse single use masks, is it all possible with the supply steady um, and you need to discard them as hazardous waste. Now, with regards to mechanical aerosol induced transmission, everything is as per contact transmission, but in addition, a surgical gown replaces the apron, so you do not need full hazmat suits. An N95 respirator is required um, because of a greater degree of filtration efficacy uh, and again, protective eyewear and good ventilation or open windows are a must. And just to remind you that a lot of dust masks are making their way into healthcare sectors uh, or so-called KN95 masks, which are industrial type masks, which are not the ones that are approved for medical use. These masks uh, become wet very easily, particularly from sweating. And the minute there is any dampening of the mask, there's a wicking effect from the exterior to the interior, bringing the organisms to your mucous membranes. So please do not use any variation of theme. Uh, it should be a uh, registered, um, and here you can see what you need uh, for FDA approval uh, and what kind of markings you need to look at an appropriately registered N95 mask or an FFP2-3 for use in the UK equivalent. So please remember also that surgical masks are used by you to protect yourselves from droplets, whereas cloth masks are used by everybody to protect the public from yourselves. And this is actually an important notion to remember. N95 respirators can be, uh, must be used during cough induction procedures um, based on infectious events. 
And in other situations like uh, the other airborne diseases, obviously they're important and it is also a single use item. Right, so the WHO so-called retractors on its steps when it outright dismissed that uh, airborne transmission uh, was not an issue. And this is because in fact, as a group of 230 odd scientists brought evidence that they said the WHO had to consider. The evidence was reviewed and the WHO did make a concession that airborne transmission could be a problem. But however, looking at the quality of the evidence and also the credentials of the people that submitted the evidence, they were all large in fact ventilation and aerobiology engineers, um, it is still maintained that contact precautions with respiratory drop precautions, i.e. surgical mask, remain the order of the day. Um, and this is to be endorsed. So some people and some important opinion leaders in this country have said that actually uh, the rapid transmission that we're seeing might well be related to airborne spread. Um, and, uh, and they've gone live saying this. And nobody can dispute that they're wrong. Maybe we don't have all the information at our fingertips and maybe it will emerge over time. But please remember one thing that we all agree that surgical masks do not have the same protective effects of an N95 respirator. But the studies and the events that were promoted by these uh, so-called engineers and scientists when they presented the data to the WHO were of coughing events or singing events or in gyms, which are confined spaces with lots of people and also in things like choirs where everybody was singing and expectorating aerosols during singing. And they considered that these two events in a closed space when there isn't any adequate ventilation in a closed environment may certainly actually allow a con concentration of, of so-called droplet nuclei to remain airborne and therefore a uh, super spreading event if you use infection control terminology um, which may be partially linked to airborne spread but but I don't think the message is that like TB and measles you just enter a room and you immediately acquire COVID-19 that's not the way it works so if it were even airborne spread what could you do well start using whatever barriers you have uh, avoid crowded spaces in your own personal life adequate ventilation, open windows, sometimes open windows in a wind environment can give you more than in fact 20 to 30 air changes an hour, right? So sometimes open air where you've got a wind can be more infected than also uh, standard air conditioning with a set ventilation rate. Um, and of course, uh, in the vehicles, open windows whenever you move. So what can we use to also reinforce the fact that maybe airborne precautions are not uh, necessary airborne transmission is not very important. Well, a systematic review has shown that just by keeping a physical distance of one meter, you can reduce the risk of getting COVID-19 by 82%. Then they looked at experimental studies showing the evidence of transmission of, um, uh, of uh, SARS-CoV-2. And they found that respirators were definitely more effective than masks, but overall people who were in the healthcare sector respiratory equipment had an 85% reduction. And eye protection resulted in a 78% reduction of infection. Now, obviously the message that is coming through here is that you don't just socially distance to get that reduction or just wear uh, masks or respirators or just deal with the eyes. You have to do all of it in one go. And that's really pretty important. And the final bit is that uh, looking at airborne transmission, the epidemiology is somehow not really very convincing yet. It's possible that we haven't counted all the cases in the world, but SARS, original SARS-CoV uh, in 2003, more or less had infection rate of one individual giving rise in the absence of interventions to two to four infectious cases. And um, the respiratory, I uh, beg your pardon, the, the reproductive ratio or rate um, differs uh, for COVID during different stages of an outbreak, but it has been put anywhere between two and four in the South African outbreak. Typically, airborne diseases like measles and chicken pox um, would actually, and TB for that matter, would give rise to many, many more min, uh, numbers of cases. So the reproduction rate, if we are measuring it correctly, um, is also not suggestive of pure airborne transmission. So basically, let's stick to respiratory droplets, contact precautions, and at risk, 
um, for uh, any aerosolization event used in 95s and always have good ventilations during quiet practice in gyms and keeping people distance. Um, infection control guidance, as all of the guidance, has changed every minute. The WHO has come out, it's been accused of giving a lot of conflicting evidence. To be honest, I mean, who knows what is going on? Uh, we are learning minute by minute. And so we have to relook at the available evidence, not be so suspicious about the WHO, um, and admit and acknowledge that we have a long way still to understand COVID disease. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much, Prof. Much appreciated and um, a lot of food for thought and things to think about and even be scared of there, but much appreciated. Um, uh, I think this is the part that a lot of us have been waiting for, and we've perhaps got half an hour so to do this now is just to 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 really speak out the questions and answers and to try and make them as practical as we can. So I want to try and veer a little bit away from guidelines and you know the academic kind of structures that we have now and really look at the practicalities. Even if we know what's right, the question is what do we do practically? So I'm just thinking, um, uh, let's start off on the chat because we're just giving the opp people opportunity who who put their, their questions and then we'll take it from there. So I see that Paul has was the first one to ask a question. Um, maybe we can spotlight Paul um, and then Paul Frankel and then um, you know just trying everyone to keep your questions concise and we'll just try and get through a lot of questions rather than long debate. Thanks, Dan. Um, thanks, Kim. Uh, Prof. Bloomberg, Prof. Desai. Uh, just a question on nasal douching, saline nasal douching. Um, the literature seems to show that it's effective in, in decreasing severity and frequency, as well as uh, viral shedding in multiple different viral upper respiratory tract infections. Um, no one's really recommending it in, in um, COVID, and I'm interested in your opinions on this, because it seems very logical. Um, the, the mechanism is being both washing ciliary effects as well as hypochlorous acid production in, in the nasal mucosa. How's it, Paul? So we don't okay. know. Again, we just really don't know. Yes, there has been one study that shows that it may decrease viral loads in other um, viruses that are colonizing the back of the nose and causing um, upper respiratory respiratory tract infections, whether that equates into significant enough reductions to prevent disease, um, not just infection, and second, that has a role in reducing you from getting just mild disease versus severe disease, we have no idea. Um, second of all, it, the caution with COVID is that COVID can last for quite a long time on surfaces. Plastic, it lasts very long time. So if the patient's already got COVID without knowing about it, it could get, get stuck on the plastic of the nasal spray or on the neti pot, um, et cetera. And so instead of getting rid of virus, you might actually introducing virus into your nasopharynx by doing that. So it's got pros and cons. Some people love douching and do it not because of anything other than that they really like it. So it's going to be hard to get someone like that to stop doing it. I would say that if a person is really symptomatic with lots of um, rhinorrhea and rhinitis type symptoms, which you usually don't get with COVID, it might be worthwhile to use it as a symptomatic type of thing. But just to reduce viral loads and prevent infection, I'm not sure that we've got any evidence that it's going to work. Thanks. Okay, great. Next question is from Karina Fenta. Uh, she didn't say she wants to ask it, so I'm going to ask it for her. Um, culture scene. Uh, we've seen a couple of articles on this. Um, any? any I'll, I'll actually ask it to Kim as well because it seems like clinical. Is there any evidence at the moment that culture scene has got a role to play in the management of COVID? So culture scene, along with other um, medications that, that have anti-inflammatory effects, like she's mentioned, the statins, um, etc., has got anti-inflammatory effects, uh, which is why we use it in inflammatory diseases like gout. The, the, the thing with um, a viral infection is that it seems like you need quite high doses over quite a prolonged time for the culture scene to potentially have an effect. But again, we just don't have enough evidence to know that it would work. 
would you give it to somebody in the viremic phase? I don't think that the inflammatory response would be of that kind of an extent that one would um, warrant it. And colchicine is really a nasty drug. The rheumatologists hardly ever use it anymore because of all the gastrointestinal side effects, which is mainly um, quite hectic diarrhea after only one or two doses in some people. Um, and they use prednisone now as a result. So there's just not enough evidence to say that it's something that one would work. Similarly with the statins. And with the melatonin on your Ear Edinburgh's question. Yes, and with melatonin as well. So I've looked after a couple of patients um, at Rosebank that have been on colchicine and statin, and I can't say that's made any difference at all, but that's not a randomized controlled trial by any means. Okay, great. Um, carrying on, um, so Dr. Marcus, Lana Marcus's questions. Um, we've, I've actually seen this myself, is that at the beginning, all the labs were looking for, maybe this is a question to Prof Bloomberg, all the labs were asking um, for, for, for volunteers for serology, um, recovered patients and people who could, you know, contribute to the antibody pool. So now it seems like um, they're not so available. Where can we send patients, especially patients who have had COVID, to contribute to the research in terms of um, having getting positive antibody tests so that they can become approved more? So they've done an extensive um, evaluation. The NHLS was involved um, and they worked through SAPRA. Um, so I'm not sure that these are ongoing, um, but I, I can let you know if any further blood samples are needed. But they did a really extensive evaluation of a huge number of uh, serological tests, both lab-based and point of care. And the only one that, that really met uh, the requirements up to date is the one that I mentioned, but it, it's really uh, not out there for, for, for uh, ordinary use, but I can follow up uh, uh, if, if needed. Thanks. Okay, great. You know, the the um, tests may improve and we may see better ones coming along, um, but at the moment, I think that their value uh, in what we, the uh, COVID we're experiencing the moment is really, very limited. It would really be seroepidemiological studies. Okay. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to carry on with Kim on the clinical side with Lauren Moreira's, um, Moreira's question. Um, the the D-dharma thing is quite a confounding um, issue for us as clinicians. Um, you know, certainly from a pulmonary embolism, we, we always cautioned against um, the quantitative one evaluation of D-dimers because they're variable. Now, we know that D-dimers are affected by age. And we also, so, so the question really that she has, she has is, where do, do, should we be correcting our D-dimers based on the patient's age? And also, uh, we've seen on our group chat, this question of how often should we be checking a patient's D-dimer? If, if we, we've had patients we've checked and they have a concerning D-dimer, but they seem to you know, maybe it's just relatively raised. How often should we be checking as, as GPs and given the difficulty it is to check a patient's blood? So we have to either bring them into the rooms or send a nurse to them or, you know, expose ourselves to risk. Just guidelines on the D-dimer monitoring. Okay, so first of all, I think it's very important that rather than looking at numbers, one really goes on the clinical impression of the patient. So how, what do you think of, Clinically, is my patient doing well or not well? Do they have mild symptoms or do they have severe symptoms? Mild symptoms, even in the setting of a really high D-dimer, is not going to warrant anticoagulation in the first week of illness, currently with the evidence that we've got. As I said, in a week's time, it might be complete junk, what I'm saying now. But I think really go clinically. Similarly, if your other blood results are quite haywire, but the patient is looking fine and feeling fine, um, I wouldn't worry about the bloods. And so that's why I wouldn't send every single person who tests COVID positive for blood results, because then you have to interpret results in a person who's really got very few symptoms. So try and reserve bloods for patients who you are not worried, that you, who, sorry, you are worried about and where you're not able to make a clinical impression of that person. You're just not quite sure, or you've got a funny feeling, or you know that they are a high risk factor person and specifically towards the end of that week. So if they're on day seven and you think, I just don't have a good feeling about them, there's something niggly, do it then. 
Do you adjust it for, for age? You know, the D-dimer is really a, quite a non-specific thing. Any inflammation is going to raise the D-dimer, not just coagulation. Um, and so, you know, we, we see casualty officers who any, somebody coming in with right side of chest pain, they get a high D-dimer and um, the patients all get sent for a CTPAs and 10% of them have pulmonary emboli. So it just shows you that it's really a very non-specific test. The level of the D-dimer is also not necessarily a prognostic indicator. So um, at towards the end of the week, I wouldn't adjust it for age. I just keep it simple. So more than one, no matter what your age is. And in a high D-dimer in the setting of clinical deterioration is significant. And then those patients should be referred on for further care. That's very helpful. Can you can you extend that to the, with Francis Fleming's next question in terms of the LDH and the LFTs? Okay, so an LFT in any viral infection, one expects to be a mild bump in the AST. Usually the ALT is normal, but the ALT may follow the AST. But usually what we're seeing in COVID is one and a half or two times AST rise. So an AST of like 50 or 60, ALT that's normal. And it's not, um, it's not, uh, required to do serial monitoring of this because COVID is not an, a virus that causes a hepatitis in the vast majority of cases. And even in really seriously sick people, you never really get a very dramatic um, hepatitis from COVID infection. So uh, if you have LFT in your bloods because you're not quite sure what you're dealing with and it's a viral thing and there's lots of things in the differential diagnosis, it's interesting to note but it doesn't prognosticate and it's not a thing that one needs to watch the trend of. Similarly with an LDH, we do use LDH in those hypoxic pneumonia stage patients and in the patients who are in the stage three disease with an inflammatory sport storm because the LDH obviously goes up quite dramatically in that stage. So at the moment, um, in the first week, I would be more interested in what my CRP is doing because if the CRP is starting to rise, that could be an indication of deterioration and going and progressing on to stage two or even stage three if they didn't require admission in stage two. So I definitely wouldn't do serial monitorings of, of um, liver functions and LDHs. Thank you. Okay, great. So I'm going to ask Sam Fee now. We're going to spotlight today and just uh, let her express herself as well as always. Sam, go for it. Thank you very much, both profs and Kim. Really appreciate your time. If you'd indulge me, I've actually got two questions. The first is, I'm not, I'm not fully understanding the value of the pre-admission, pre-surgical PCR testing on our patients, because we all know that a negative is could quite easily be a false negative. So we get a negative and they get admitted in the incubation phase, or they could be quite infectious. And a positive could have been from an effect, infection up to four weeks, I've had a patient who's continued to test positive seven weeks post-infection. So that's the one thing that I'm finding um, slightly tricky to manage with my patients, particularly the very fit cyclist who's going in for a hair transplant and finds out that his pre-admission COVID PCR is positive and he's phoning me you know, from his peloton of 16 people having just cycled 60 kilometers, what do we do with that result? Um, but his the hair transplant was cancelled and we obviously on current guidelines had to incubate all direct, con uh, all, I mean, isolate all direct contacts. So Lucille, I think that's probably for you, but that's the first thing. I, I, we, we all try to navigate this and use it as, as well as possible, but that doesn't make any sense to me at all. And then the second is we're all debating and, and stressing over, is it eight days isolation? Is it 14 days isolation? My final patient on Saturday afternoon was a chemist, a pharmacist from a, uh, a government hospital who I saw on Saturday because on the Monday previously had presented to HR at her hospital with a huge fever and a dry cough, had been sent to the NHLS for a test um, and were, they refused to sign her off until she got the result. So she wandered around administering medication in full pneumonic COVID for a week and then presented to me on Saturday as a new patient looking for anyone who could get her a private test, which I got in 24 hours, 
which is positive. Her boyfriend had already gone to a funeral. So what do we do with that? I mean, we're so nervous about what we're doing in our very, very well-behaved sector, but if our healthcare workers in our Department of Health hospitals are not being allowed to isolate with a dry cough and a fever while they wait for their result, the genie's really out of the bottle. Yeah, yeah. So um, thanks very much, V. Um, I think those are major issues. Then we do the second one uh, first. So just to mention that the eight days um, has not come into practice yet. It will probably be released in the next few days. So it remains 14 until it's official. And those guidelines will be released. They'll be on the uh, NRCD website and will be shared. Just in terms of the eight days, it's day naught is the day of onset of, of, of symptoms. So essentially return to work will be on day nine. That's the traditional infectious disease timing. And um, at day eight, um, a, a positive PCR may not mean anything. And in the, in the, um, in the studies that have been done, um, most patients were culture negative at eight days, um, which would, and epidemiological studies would support that they're no longer infectious at that time. So positive PCR at eight days probably also doesn't mean very much. Um, so those long PCRs are really very hard uh, to, to deal with. And it's the, in, in, in severely ill patients, you may have much longer um, a, 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 a virus that's viable, hence the uh, eight days after um, they have um, stabilized, which means they no longer uh, need oxygen. I saw a question there. So, you know, I think um, there are bad practices. Anyone you suspect of COVID in the work setting uh, should be um, isolated uh, while they're awaiting for the test result. And that's not an acceptable practice to send them back uh, to look after patients or be um, in a setting where they can transmit the disease. And people are most infectious the day before and in the first few days of illness. That's when they have the most virus. So that's not an acceptable practice. Um, what about patients being admitted uh, or having to go in for procedures or going in every week? Yes, you're absolutely right. If it's negative, it may not exclude it. Um, PCR is, is, is pretty good. It's about 80, 75 to 80%. And that's what we've got at the moment. We don't have anything else. And healthcare workers really should be protected um, in hospitals. Uh, for, for high-risk procedures. If it's negative, um, yes, they may be in the incubation period, and how often do you test them in hospital? I think with the limited availability of tests, it obviously, you know, that is a challenge. And that's another reason um, why healthcare workers should take protection. But it also poses um, some, some difficulties when you're putting people in wards, COVID negative wards, COVID positive wards, you know, I, I think we, we don't have that all right at the moment. So, yeah, I think that's the best I can do with those difficult questions. And did you say it was going in for a hair transplant? And I think those are uh, routine operations that are probably not happening at the moment. But lots of space in those in those diaries. There's lots of space for that at the moment. <laughs> and so, Lucille, what, sorry, Lucille, sorry. Why, 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 sorry, go ahead, Kim, go ahead. No, finish. You finish. Stay on, and then no, I'll say. Okay. So, so, so while Lucille was on the eight day story, I just want you know. So certainly, we are seeing patients who are coming in at, at as Kim spoke about at the end of the week when they some the few are moving on to the mnemonic phase. Okay, they may come into the doctors' rooms and say, I, "I've done my days." Or, well, at the moment, they've been coming in obviously at fourteen days, but they, in the future, they will come in at eight days. So, I've done my days. I'm still coughing. Um, I'm, I'm, but I'm not infectious anymore because I've done my eight days, um, yet they're still very symptomatic. Can yeah. we say at that stage that people like that are safe to return to the community or even are safe to come to us as clinicians? Or, you know, it seems as though patients like that may be infectious for longer. Um, can so, you comment on that? Yeah, so symptoms may last for, for uh, days to even weeks after uh, onset. I think we've all, you know, seen patients with that. Um, but, but typically, by day eight, um, the number of 
it, 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 unless they're getting worse, that, that, that's a different scenario. But someone who's uh, getting better, day eight, I, I think it would be safe to, to de-isolate them. I think there's enough information uh, to support that. But if they're getting worse, well, you know, they, they may fall in that category where uh, they have high, higher viral loads and they're the ones with more severe disease where it would be uh, eight days after the symptoms have set. Okay, so Sam, I just wanted to say that Netcare has now decided that they're not going to do pre-admission COVID testing anymore, which is a massive victory for all <laughs> ID <laughs> people. <laughs> and, and just because we know the massive mm. um, limitations with the testing and that a positive test today does not mean, I mean, a negative yeah. test today does not mean a negative test tomorrow. The hospital has no more green zones. Everything is yellow and red. So it really doesn't matter what your COVID status is if you are coming for something unrelated to COVID. But as Lucille said, there's really no elective stuff happening, unfortunately, anymore. But it's just not possible to do anymore. So it probably makes it even less relevant. But I'm really happy that they've decided that they don't need this pre-hospital testing anymore. It's taken a load off the labs and saving a lot of money that didn't need to be done. Well, that's, that's good to hear that, Kim. I, I must say, I didn't know that. Other hospitals are still doing that, but um, yeah. perhaps it's a practice that we need to extend. Yeah. Okay, great, thanks. Let, let's move on to Nicola Raines. Um, she's got a question and she's happy to ask the question herself. So over to her. I'm trying to unmute. <laughs> I can't unmute. Okay. Are we there? Can you hear me? We, we can. Hello. So, Lucille and Kim, I can understand the eight day isolation period if you've been infected. Mm. But if you have been exposed, then surely the quarantine should still be 14 days. So it's, it's caused a lot of um, discussion. Um, you know, the, the median incubation period is, is about five to six days. Um, but we're having a lot of, um, I think many people are having um, challenges uh, in hospitals where essential health workers are just falling by the wayside and there isn't enough staff. So the testing is at five days. Um, probably you'll get the results in six or seven, you know, at day six or seven. And then it's about coming to work with the full protection. So it is surgical masks, it is visors, it's staying away from immunocompromised patients, uh, it's watching for symptoms. So there is a proviso there. Um, a lot of people have said, well, you know, this is the median incubation period and is this really a safe thing to do? Um, I think it's still a little bit up for discussion, but that's what's gone into the guidelines. And I hear exactly what you're saying. Um, and it's, uh, it's been debated uh, at length. Um, but, you know, we're having hospitals with, with no staff uh, in, in key areas. And I think this was a, um, a reasonably safe compromise. Yeah, I think a lot of other countries are doing this now. We're not alone in this. Um, certainly in the uh, European Union, they have, um, the ECDC have put out guidelines that are very similar and, another, and a number of other countries have, are also doing this and are not having major, major issues. But, but that relates to the healthcare workers, not to the public. That's the healthcare worker because they that will be, yeah. Yes, absolutely. It's the healthcare worker. They are wearing protective gear. They wear a surgical mask at all times. Um, they have to monitor. Um, and uh, if there are any symptoms, they will be re-evaluated and will be retested. Okay. Um, while we have you, uh, Professor just uh, so Debbie Earl has asked, um, and this is a broader question the free testing and the screening i mean we saw this in in overseas uh, in, in in the east and they were doing widespread screening on, on on thousands of people um it seems like the free testing is a waste of, of limited resources because 
if we are so limited in our tests, why are we yeah. running these free testing campaigns? Can you comment on that? So, uh, yes, I don't think everyone agrees that it's the right thing to do. The um, community testing was done uh, to try and identify so-called hotspots. Um, I don't think it had great yield. And certainly, um, given the, the shortage of tests um, and the, the long delays in, in, as, as a result, um, I think it was um, something that was, uh, yeah, perhaps uh, shouldn't have been done. So they're still doing testing, community testing. Um, but that, uh, you know, is not a priority. Uh, I think it takes, people have different um, ideas of what should be done. Um, the advisory committees have prioritized testings and they really hospitalize patients, healthcare workers with symptoms and community testing should not be done. We've got widespread transmission now, you know, you know, what is it really going to show you? Okay. So it should Thank not you. be done. Thank you. Um, okay, just to go back to the clinical side, and Brian Levine spent most of his day interacting with Discovery, I'm sure, again. So we, he's asked me to ask the question for him. Um, to ask Kim, so, so Brian said, well, well, the baseline oxygen saturation that we accept as being okay. I mean, we've, we've heard other clinicians speaking about it, it depends on the, obviously the clinical state that the patient's in. And um, we expect a different baseline, obviously, in a COPD patient to a normal patient, for example. How many points do we consider to be a significant drop? And while you're on oxygen, just do, can you make a comment on, um, you know, where, where are we at in terms of whether there's oxygen, whether there is are shortages of oxygen um, in the community as a whole, and whether we envisage having problems with oxygen in the hospitals in terms of, you know, half flow, um, nasal cannulas, et cetera, that you guys are using um, patients going forward, anything you know about? So yes, there's massive um, shortages of oxygen, unfortunately. Um, uh, and it's really the most important thing that you can do to help a person with COVID with the least side effects and <laughs> the most evidence. So first of all, yes, I agree. It would be really nice to have baseline sats on all of our patients, COVID and not COVID, because it definitely helps make a person feel calm when you know that your COPD is usually got sats of 83%. And so when he's got sets of 80 and 79%, you know, it's not quite as dramatic as what it may seem in somebody who's used to sets of 94, 95%. It's also important to remember that we live in Johannesburg at an altitude of 2000 meters. And so our sets are not all going to be 99 and 100%. And so we probably all sit in around 93, 94% most of the time anyway. So Whilst it would be nice to have a baseline, I just don't think given the numbers that it's something which is viable. As I said, if your patient has the means to get a pulse oximeter when they test positive, that's wonderful. If you are able to rent out pulse oximeters to patients and watch trends rather than just a once off set, that's ideal. Um, so it's just to then understand what your patient's risk factors are, smoking, COPD, asthmatic, et cetera, and to know that they're probably going to have a much lower oxygen saturation to start off with. There's no real cutoff. And again, one would really go clinically. So not just what is your saturation, but are you talking a full sentence to me without pausing for breath? Can you walk all the way around your garden, all the way around the house many times a day? Or are you going to the toilet and feeling short of breath or sitting on your chair and getting out of your pajamas and getting short of breath? So those are things to include with the pulse oximeter reading and not just the absolute level. Um, in terms of when would it be appropriate? So I also wanted to chat about this earlier, but there's just no time and so much to say is that as more and more and more patients come, the hospitals are full. And I think that you guys are going to be vital in managing a whole bunch of these um, second phase patients at home who probably if they had a bit of oxygen and a little bit of monitoring, one could actually get them through without even being admitted in hospital. Just simply because you're gonna phone five different hospitals, they're all gonna tell you that they don't have a bed or the patient's not on a medical aid and can't go to a 
a private hospital and the state hospitals are really overflowing. So what can we do in those patients? There's lots and lots of um, oxygen companies. So even though the oxygen is in short supply, at the moment, they're not saying no to patients who can pay for an oxygen concentrator or an oxygen cylinder. It's not that expensive for a week or two. And most people would be able to afford that rather than the 25 or 50,000 rand down payment that you'd need for a hospital admission. So I think that that's really something to consider in your private patients um, or when you just cannot get a bed anywhere. Uh, so, and that really makes a massive, massive difference. And that's all that a lot of these patients just need is a bit of oxygen. Thank you, Kim. Um, okay, so I'd, I want, I'd like to move on here to, to Dr. Marcus's question. Perhaps we can ask, ask Prof. Duzay about that. Um, we, we, for, for, we just, can you comment on patients who need the flu vaccine who haven't had it yet? Is there concern about a patient who's had COVID who hasn't had the flu vaccine and now wants to do it? Um, in other words, is it, is it safe to be vaccinating patients against influenza at the same time that they may have or may be susceptible to a COVID infection? Yes, it should be very safe. I mean, influenza is a killed vaccine for a start, and I'm not really sure that uh, there's a contraindication to have a flu jab if you have had COVID disease. Uh, so the answer, in my opinion, yes, but any inputs from the rest of the panel um, would be welcome. No, so I don't think any contraindication. Very little flu, takes two weeks to work. Um, not sure there's much flu vaccine around, um, but yes, it is. It, it's fine. I agree with Adrian. Okay, so while I have Prof. Desai on the screen here, um, Paul, Paul asked another question, is, is, there a role, is there a role for toilet blocks? Those little <laughs> detergent blocks that hang in the toilet, but I mean, the humor aside, um, should we be sanitizing toilet because of, you know, the, what measures should we be taking? And we all have, most of us have toilets in our practices and we use toilets for patients to do urine dipsticks, et cetera. Any, any um, you know, in other words, and I mean, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna broaden that question um, is that, you know, it's all very well saying that we need to go and we need to assess each patient when they come in and see what is their level of expected risk and then decide on our level of PPE and wear it. But if you're dealing with a flow of patients on a daily basis and in winter, the patients do come in complaining about pain behind their eyes and, you know, you know, the things that may be overlapping with COVID, what are the recommendations that you make in terms of dealing with your undifferentiated patient who may come in not screened um, and, and just like a quick change between patients to keep your room safe without going overboard or underboard. Okay, so uh, just to re-emphasize one principle, the minute you say that you might see lots of patients with potential symptoms, it means that you're not doing, in fact, a, a telephone booking with the risk assessment. Uh, but let's move away from that altogether. And let's assume there is a steady stream of people that come in with non-specific symptoms. Well, number one, the toilet block um, is not really going to be that effective. It contains detergent. It contains a bit of, uh, of perfumes, <laughs> makes the whole area smell a bit better and feel cleaner. But the spatter that is created through a flush toilet and the amount of aer aerosols aboard are not going to be uh, counteracted by the toilet block. So um, rather close the lid and, um, and that is a better way to prevent uh, any spatter of stuff coming out. The second important point is uh, regarding toilets. So I'm talking about the questions that have come through. There isn't really a protocol to say that you must actually clean the toilet all the time and after every single patient, uh, because it's not possible. Um, the, the recommendation is that a practice should be cleaned once very thoroughly every day. And if to the best of your knowledge, you have cohorted your patients with respiratory symptoms towards a specific sector of the day, and you then decontaminate the rooms after that, so be it. Small things that you can do are frequent touch surfaces disinfection. For example, if there's no grime, it will take very little for you to pass an alcohol wipe um, over, for example, a bed area or over any other surface that has been touched um, by you or by the patient. That is something that is easy to do um, and, and can be done at any time. Some of the wipes used for this purpose also contain hydrogen peroxide, but they're much, much more expensive. Um, and that becomes usually a deterrent uh, to the use. 
if there's any encrustation on any practice material or in the toilet, the spatter because somebody's had diarrhea, and diarrhea could be one of the manifestations of COVID, and feces does contain some virus, times, uh, then those kind of events need to be managed. A lot of people um, in Finland, for example, and other countries are putting instruction, uh, which you hope the patients will follow, of how to, for example, decontaminate the hands by using the same piece of paper that they wash the hands with to close the tap and open the, the toilet door so they don't touch handles. Um, if there's any obvious spatter or dirt and somebody could inspect it, perhaps the clean of your practice with PPE, they're going to clean it properly on a continuous basis, um, you know, like two or three times a day, um, then, then a cleaner needs to do that. But really, it is not possible to have a full practice clean uh, in a decontamination session um, after every single patient that you see. So you limit the exposure risk partly by patient education when they're going to the toilet, how they uh, need to handle handles, et cetera, and, uh, and also clean the toilet seat with a detergent disinfectant like domestos or, or even alcohol if there's no grime or soil that can be left there. But those are, are the best bits of advice. You know, the Finnish guidelines are the only ones that particularly actually cover in any great detailed toilets. And they always talk to a cleaner going in and doing it for you, which is not very really practical after every patient who may have an overlapping sim symptom of, uh, of COVID, uh, which will be in breach of the whole population. So you need to be pragmatic, do your best. If there's any visible soil, a cleaner should go in with PP and get rid of it. Uh, ask patients to do whatever they can if they're going to bathroom, for example, by putting detailed instructions and putting the appropriate solutions and wipes in place. Um, and as far as your practice goes, um, again, be pragmatic and just wipe down uh, with, with, with alcohol, uh, whatever the patient is deemed to have touched. That's the easiest. But um, Kim, what do you do in your practice? It's very interesting to see how all of this translates into, into rooms with patients pouring in and out. And in Kim's case, a lot of them, in fact, COVID positive. Yeah, so I, what we do is I've bought a whole bunch of the baby bum wet wipes. Yeah. We've taken them out of the packet, put them into a sealed plastic container, decanted a bottle of D-germ into them, and we use those as wet wipes to wipe all surfaces in between patients. Um, so chairs, the examining um, bed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Our toilets are shared toilets in the building, so we're not responsible for the cleaning of toilets. And I think all the building um, agents have done is to increase the amount of time that the ladies go in there to clean. So every time I go in there, there's usually another lady in there also busy cleaning the toilet. So they're definitely cleaning the, the loos quite frequently, but not after every person. It's just not sustainable. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to do something a little bit different for a second, and I'm going to ask someone who's joined our panel, uh, not our panel, our audience here tonight, um, and that's Dr. Selwyn Schwartz, who's actually a dermatologist, to answer the next question. I asked him on WhatsApp if he's happy to, and he is. Um, we're seeing a lot of patients coming in daily with chill blains this year. Um, we're not sure why more than usual, and we're not sure whether these chill blains are something to do with COVID. We've been having, we've, on our group, we've spoken a lot about COVID toe. Is it, isn't it? Should patients be testing? Shouldn't they be, et cetera? Um, we've got Selwyn here. I'm just going to find him quickly to spotlight him and he can un unmute himself and start talking anyway. Um, there he is. Um, but um, Sel, do you want to, this is Selwyn Schwartz, everyone. He's a dermatologist who works at the Shopping Center. And um, it's great to have him. And um, we'd love to hear his views on this uh, as a cue to, to GPs. Sure. So we had a webinar recently for dermatology. Uh, I think it was yeah, for the Dermatology Society. And they actually concluded that, um, you know, they've seen COVID all over the country, as we know. And um, we only see chill blains really in Janisburg. They're not seeing it in Durban. They're not seeing it in Cape Town. Um, it seems to be a thing related to the web, uh, the weather at the moment. And um, okay. most recently, there was a study, and I think it came from Spain, that um, they actually concluded that it's not related. Chilblains is not due to COVID as such. So um, I would say that if you are seeing patients with chilblains, 
um, unless they've got any other symptoms at the moment. So if they've got a temperature, loss of taste, loss of smell, um, any other gastric symptoms, then you want to perhaps test for um, COVID. But if they've got just chillblains by itself, it's related to the weather at the moment and circulatory. Um, there is a study which I can possibly post later on the group, a new study, as I said, which um, shows that it isn't linked. Um, but we've all heard of the COVID toe story and everyone's scared of that. But it's ridiculous that the people queuing to have COVID tests based on the fact that they've got chillblains alone. Okay, great. That's really very reassuring. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, thank you for that. So we really appreciate you being here. And it was a nice surprise. So thank you very much. Um, okay, I, I just want to go to Stephen Levy's question, which I will address to maybe to Prof Desai, if that's okay. Um, and that's just to uh, just from a virology perspective, or maybe even to either of the profs. Um, how do we explain that some people get COVID in a family and others don't, despite despite repeat exposure or close exposure? Um, and then if I could add a second part to that question, or something that's really been coming up a lot in the group is when you have a family that gets COVID in stages. So, you know, the father will get it and a few days later the mother will get it and a few days later the son will get it. How do you control the quarantine period or the isolation periods for that? Because, um, you know, if you don't count the first eight or even 14 days and then stop it because you will land up with a staged infection and they perhaps should be isolating for longer. So could you comment on those two, please? So I'll leave the second question to Lucille, who I'm sure will talk to you about the, the multiple quarantine effects and that some people will no longer be susceptible in that family and, and therefore you need to be more pragmatic. But um, your first question was around um, why do some people get infected and others not? Um, infection is never 100% phenomenon. There might be genetic factors, susceptibility factors, different infectious dose exposures. There are a multiplicity of reasons why in a group of people exposed to an agent, there's not a 100% uptake. It happens with every infectious disease. And exactly which of those is the most important factor um, is really difficult to explain because it may differ on a case-to-case -case basis. But um, it really is, um, it should not be expected that everybody exposed to infection will become ill. There's not a, a solitary infection that I'm aware of uh, where that is a rule. Thank you. So I think Adrian has kind of answered that. Um, you know, we don't know about immunity, but it's likely that in the immediate period after infection, you, uh, you may not get reinfected. <laughs> I think it's really a very pragmatic approach and, and, and being reasonable about uh, the isolation. Um, I think the, the person who got infected first is, is going to be uh, uh, non-infectious and uh, yeah, I think some reasonable, pragmatic, common sense approach to that would be would be fine. Adrian, do you want to add see, anything? No, I'm happy. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you see, this the, this question seems very um, academic, and I mean, we put this on a group, and it's a, um, I think Dr. Fanerov said it sounded like a grade eleven maths problem, but the rea the reality is that. Um, <laughs> we're getting this question a lot uh, if, yeah. if you have a family where one member of the family gets the infection and then another one does and then another one does what they're asking is because they're all isolating together is it fine for the initial members of the family initial people who are initially infected to go out into the community even though other people in the family are quarantining at home so you know and everyone in the home. community yeah everyone in the community needs to wear a mask and the mask protects against infection from infected people. That's really the, um, the main aim. I think it's to take reasonable precautions, but yes, I think they can go out to the community with the mask as, as is required. So, so then on that point, um, Dr. Scott's question, well, on this area of thinking, how long after recovering from COVID would you consider someone exempt from quarantine after a second exposure? <laughs> The second exposure, gosh, I don't think we know the answer to that. You know, one immunity is, is, is something people don't know about. Um, I think if you're exposed again, it's the same rules. I don't think anybody can, uh, you know, have a clear answer to that. One of the things we're still learning, sorry. 
and an antibody test isn't really going to help you. We're not really quite sure what it means. Anyone else want to add to that? I think we don't know. Adrian, Kim? No, okay, yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> perfect. I just don't know. Norm Okay, great. Perfect. We, we won't know those sometimes. I'm going to move on. Um, I'm going to, we're going to try to get to the end of the questions. We're nearly there. Um, and I'm asking each of the doctors who wants to speak live. So if you haven't been asked, it's coming to you soon. Um, so <laughs> do, Dr. Edenberg has asked me to ask on his behalf. Um, I'll ask him this question. Is there a place for GPs to use cortisone? Um, I know that two of us um, who work together in this group are, are um, Dr. David off and I are managing a patient or two at the moment who we've considered putting on cortisone. Um, the question is, is there a place to be putting patients who are not in hospital and not on oxygen at home on cortisone um, because of the fear that they're going into the pneumonic phase and the bloods are showing so, and we want to reduce the inflama inflammatory response by putting them on a do daily dose of prednisone or, or, or something like that. Yeah, so, so again, I think as things get busier and busier, we're gonna have more and more patients that we're gonna to have to manage at home. And if you wanna wait and see how the patient does when they start to deteriorate, I think it's reasonable to start them on if they need home oxygen and you're ordering home oxygen for them. I think it's reasonable to start them on cortisone at the same time. So I think that is a good idea. Um, and then wait and see how they go. And if they hopefully you fix them and you, they don't need admission after that. And that relieves the burden on the hospital, makes a bed for somebody else, etc. So I definitely think that if you can manage people at home and they can pay for it, but they do need monitoring. You can't just whack someone on cortisone and then forget about them. So that does make it a bit more labor intense and they might need a visit from you now and again, or, you know, a daily Skype chat or something like that. So you can't just stop them on cortisone and then leave them there. But I think we're going to be doing it to more and more and more people because other hospitals are just full. Great. Um, um, okay, sorry, I'm just scanning the questions over here. I think we've dealt with the next one. Um, and the quarantine, I think you've dealt with as well. Um, I, I, I just want to, okay, Dr. Setzer's question as well, we've dealt with. Um, Dr. Kruger's question, how infectious is a patient in the cytokine storm period? So yeah, can, can we talk about the three phases I mean, you, you spoke about how the initial phase is patients very uh, infectious. The, the second pneumonic phase, it, seem, it seemed like we indicated less infectious, but if a patient does go properly into that phase and they have COVID pneumonia, surely they are still infectious. And certainly if they have a cytokine st storm. So the question is, how, you know, do, do, are we looking at three different variable lengths of infectiousness? Uh, I don't know who, maybe Prof. Dizay yeah. or, or, or... So, Prof. so Prof. I can answer some of that. Certainly patients with more severe disease um, are infectious for longer. And um, in terms of de-isolating severe patients, it's, it's eight days after they are no longer dependent on oxygen. So that is the recommendation. And they definitely have more virus for longer. Okay, great. Um, can, um, so Sh Dr. Sharoni Cohen's asking, please talk about the relevant relative benefits of the O2, of the oxygen concentrator versus cylinder. We know that oxygen concentrators might be more available for us. Um, are they, is this a good modality for us to be trying to organize for patients? Maybe Kim, uh, if that, that's quite clinical in terms of daily management and you're doing that with patients on oxygen at the moment? Yeah, so an oxygen concentrator is much better because it doesn't come with oxygen that needs to be topped up, whereas obviously a cylinder can get finished and that happens pretty fast. An oxygen concentrator, though, is not going to give you more than sort of, depending on what settings you've got, probably 35% oxygen. So it got ranges between sort of 28 to 35% oxygen and you can then adjust the flow versus an, an oxygen cylinder where in there is sort of quite um, pure oxygen. So you could potentially put a patient on really high concentrations of oxygen. So most of the oxygen companies now give oxygen concentrators, which use the ambient air and concentrate it, which means they don't need to keep coming to bring more oxygen to you because you've finished it. It kind of lasts forever until the machine needs to be um, 
fixed. The problem with the concentrator, though, is you need electricity. And now we've just started load shedding again. So that's potentially an issue. Whereas the cylinder, um, you just open and close the valve and you don't rely on electricity for it to work. So some of the concentrators have a bit of a battery. They, I don't think they last four hours, though. So that might be an issue. Okay, thank you. Um, so, um, so just the, the we on the fourth last one, third last one. Um, just a, co a comment from Francis Fleming about how how um, Dr. Fleming had a patient who's done so well at home and um, went right up from sets of seventy four percent using home oxygen, Clexane, Palmazon, um, and under Dr. Kim's support. And we really all have felt this so much. And I think this is really something that we need to work as a collaboration at working with a group of physicians like we had two weeks ago when we met with Dr. Zinman and Dr. Shul. Um, you, you know, like the role here is for GPs to play, a, to, to really be the MO, so to speak, for the infectious disease physicians for patients at home. Because to put patients who are, can manage at home with home modalities into hospital and I clog the hospitals, be exposed them to further risk is just not something that we, that's sustainable. And I think that if we as a group can start looking at how we can work cohesively to do this as a team, we'll be able to certainly do a lot and then that can be replicated. So I'm sure that everybody supports that, but um, thank you to Kim and people like Kim who are supporting us daily with these decisions that we sometimes feel unable to, to make. Um, so um, I've spoken a bit about load shedding. Um, so I think Stephen Levy would like to ask a question. Do you, would you like to unmute yourself? He, he wrote this to me privately, so he's not on that list, but he wants to yeah, ask sure. a question um, and we will just spotlight him. Thanks. Um, can I address this to Kim and just uh, thank you to everyone for this amazing panel and it's so informative. Um, I've had a few patients that presented with COVID and then they seem to have settled down over the next number of weeks, four, five, six. And then they've had almost like a relapse of very similar but more severe symptoms. And I can't put it down to something else. So influenza swab negative and they're feeling terrible. I mean, can one get reinfected with COVID so soon after an initial infection? Should one re-swab these patients? Um, what do you suggest in a scenario like this? It's, it's a difficult one. Um, we, we expect that people who've had a true COVID positive infection is going to have some degree of immunity for this season of COVID. So it appears that in the vast majority of people, you are unlikely to have two, um, two episodes of COVID following so closely on each other. Um, we do know that the antibodies are probably not going to be very long lasting. And so certainly there is a concern that in subsequent years, you might be pro, um, at least susceptible to having COVID infections again, which makes perfect sense given that we already know that you can have rhinovirus every single year and influenza over and over again, et cetera. So we hope that the vaccine will help that if we ever get a nice, good, effective vaccine. So my answer is that if it's within weeks of the infection, I think it's probably unlikely to be a repeat COVID, but one can simply never rule it out. So if they are in a high risk environment where the potential for them spreading to many people or in a sort of healthcare setting where they are working with potentially very vulnerable people, I would ask them to re-isolate and just monitor for deterioration. I wouldn't ask them to re-swab again. And I would try and exclude other things because I think that that is the most likely. We don't need to go and make definite diagnoses for the vast majority of uh, viral type infections, although we like to do it and that we always like to have an answer and a diagnosis. But I think it just becomes a, an extra burden on the patient's finances, the labs, et cetera. So monitor symptomatically and isolate if they're in a high um, risk environment, I think. Thanks. And just reassure the patient that it's really unlikely that it, that this is a second COVID infection um, right now. It's winter, we're getting millions of viruses flying around like crazy. Our kids are starting to go back to school. Everyone's going back to work. So viruses are going to start spreading again. Other viruses. Thank you. Okay, great. We basically at the end, um, I just, a couple of things. The one is that... Um, 
Brian has asked a question here, and I actually think it's actually come to me privately, but he, just while I have Kim on the screen here, he, she, he just asked, Brian Levine asked me to ask you, can you just comment on Clexane versus oral agents um, in terms of anticoagulation? Because obviously it's much easier for us to order a patient an oral agent at home and not try and teach them how to give themselves Clexane without actually showing them. So, you know, yeah. when we do yeah. decide to use that with some, can yeah. you just comment on that from an outpatient perspective? So there's lots of things to think of. I agree. It's much easier to take a tablet versus an injection. Who's at home looking after the patient? Are they isolating completely alone in a way it's really difficult and lots of people simply cannot give themselves an injection? So a tablet is better. The problem with the NOAX is that they're really, really expensive. And we're not sure what dose to give. So do you go full anticoagulation? Do you do the loading dose? We just really don't know. So I think discuss it with your patient and let them make the decision if it's somebody in the second phase that you're trying to manage at home. And just discuss the pros and cons, the cost, the administration, etc. We think that they will have a similar mechanism of action and do the same thing. So it really goes down to what's easier for the patient and I'd make it their decision. Thank you. Okay, last question I'll take for the night. And just remember, this is not last question as a, as a whole, because all, that, all of the, let's call it the six panelists we've had so far, have all said that they were open to help us, um, you know, ongoing, and we'll try and set up those structures. So, but just for tonight, um, I, I want to take a question, like a, a different question is, we've got one of the members on our group is a doctor who, who's um, qualified at BITS, and then she emigrated and went to live in Israel and she's involved in, in, in Israel as a family for doctor there. And she actually manages, uh, she's joined like a COVID team there, like, you know, doing a lot of telephone con uh, consultations. Um, she, she, she'd like to contrast a bit like the difference between what they're doing there with what we're doing here and ask a question on that. So um, if we can ask Tali Cohen to switch on her video, I think it's on and there she is in Israel. And um, yeah, go for it. Hi, so thank you so much firstly for this uh, panel, like really very, very interesting, important things here. I was just wondering, you know, in Israel, as in some other countries, to de-isolate COVID patients, we require two negative tests, um, and or, or at least now they're changing it, maybe, maybe after 30 days, they'll stop testing him. If they keep testing positive for 30 days, they'll give up and, um, and you know, and, and consider them, um, um, fine to de-isolate. So I was just wondering, it's such a huge difference. What is the kind of evidence base behind this difference? And is it is it possible that in, in um, South Africa, we are actually de-isolating people who actually are still infected? So um, thanks very much, Tali. So the, the studies um, looking at culture, which is really um, what you want to know, because it may give you an idea of infectiousness of that patient, after eight days, mild disease are for the most part negative. So um, testing at, you know, the 14 days um, is, is in most countries no longer required. Repeat testing at 14 days is no longer required. Remember that the PCR can be positive and can remain positive, but does not indicate um, infectious virus. It may just be bits of RNA. So most countries have um, moved away from retesting at 14 days. And many countries have now brought the, the, um, the period of, of um, isolation down to eight days. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, I think we, we are moving uh, in the right direction. Um, and this is mild disease. And um, yeah, I think that, that's where we are at the moment. And even the WHO have moved away from testing at 14 days. We don't have enough tests. It's quite a mission for patients to go and be tested. And we need to prioritize our testing for those who really can benefit from it or where there's a public health benefit. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so firstly, just a, a big thank you again, really, to all three of the panelists who have taken out their time this late at night to to share their knowledge with us. 
um, without any of the diplomacy. I mean, in, in seriousness, we're all exhausted, including you. And uh, we really appreciate you spending this time with us um, this late at night on, on, a, on a cold winter's night. Um, I, I just want to make so, um, so Dan, just before everyone... you, you so just before you close, yeah, the guidelines that uh, yeah. I presented tonight are not official yet, should not be put in place. Please wait until they are released. But this is where this is the direction that we're going in. So not to be put in so, place yet. So, so perhaps just a, a closing word from each of you, and, th and then we'll finish off. So, so while, I, while we have you, Prof Bloomberg, do you, would you like to say anything that, you know, to, the, to, to GPs out there as a whole? Yeah, be safe. You're doing great work. Um, not sure how long COVID's going to go, but uh, yeah, I think the next few months, particularly in Gauteng, are going to be really, really difficult. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Prof Desire? Um, I'd just like to say that in the absence of a vaccine in the foreseeable future, maybe next year, but who knows, is it immunogenic, does it work or whatever, IPC, infection prevention control, is really your only defense against this. So please um, apply it rigorously because it will go some way, in fact, a long way to keep you safe. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you so much. Um, to an ex a message on exhaustive Dr. Peterson at the end of a <laughs> long weekend call. <laughs> Um, well, what I wanted to say is that the, I think the most important thing in COVID is to trust yourself. You guys are doing an, an amazing job and the gut feeling you get in the beginning when you see the patient, because you know most of your patients so well, is, is the right one. And lots of people phone me and say, we don't know what the right thing to do is. Must I do this? Must I do that? Just trust yourselves because I've spoken to so many of you and you all make excellent assessments and are so on top of everything. So please, yeah. you know, just keep going. It's You're doing well, yeah. really, really well. So, so don't have doubts. Thank you so much. Okay, just a couple of things from the group. Um, a few, a few little like things that we're doing. The one is the continuation of the of the article project that we're doing. So, if there are doctors who would like to write for the Facebook group, please do. Um, Corin's putting that together. We really feel as though putting out positive information that's evidence based is what's what's good for the community as a whole. Please continue to 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 contribute towards that and just write on the big WhatsApp group if you want to know how to get involved. That would be great. Um. The second thing is Corin's put together a support group for doctors on our group who have COVID who, or who, who have recently had it. And um, unfortunately we have doctors on the group who have it at the moment. Please join this because it's something we all are scared of being in that position. And once you're in that position, we'd really like us to have support from one another. So please, please do that. Um, the third is the mentorship that Dan Stillman spoke about at the beginning. We'll post a link soon, but Certainly in our practice, we've been linking up patients who've had COVID with patients who have it at the moment. And we find that just from an emotional perspective, when uh, even someone who's not very affected but gets the diagnosis, one of the, one of the biggest things that affects them is just this fear of being isolated alone and COVID positive. And we find that speaking to them, speaking to someone else who's been in a similar situation from a similar age group and, 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 and profile really helps them to get through that time. And we want to try and roll that out where the doctors can do it more. We'll help try and facilitate that when the time allows. And um, these are just some of the endeavors. So um, really thank you to everybody. And again, thank you. He's not here anymore because he was on a long, long, he actually is still here. He just writes on the group <laughs> chat. But thank you to Dan Silliman for once again at the beginning, just being here to help with the tech. And thank you very much to my wife, Simon, who's been spotlighting people as we've been going through this Q&A. She's becoming as good as Dan Silliman. Um, somewhere else in my house, I don't know where she is, but she's doing it. And we really appreciate it and to everyone for all this just group effort, because this is all about group effort. As you have ideas, please bring them to the group and stay safe. So good night, everyone. Thanks for your time. We'll send out the recording tomorrow. God bless. Night, everyone.